welcome to today's episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom. We'd like to thank our episode sponsor, Takeda Oncology, for their support of Myeloma Crowd Radio. Now, this show is a special one to me. Uh, when I was first diagnosed at the age of 43, it was a complete blow. My husband, Paul, and I had six young kids, and like most of you, had never heard of multiple myeloma. I, I was seen first by a general oncologist who came highly recommended, and without doing a bone marrow biopsy, he looked at my blood tests and said, I think you have multiple myeloma. We'll start you on Velcade on Friday and see how things go and probably do a stem cell transplant in a few months if that doesn't work. And he said, he encouraged me and said, don't worry, you won't lose your hair. Well, what Paul and I really wanted him to show me or us were patients that were in my same situation, what they had received for treatment and how long they were living. When it came to treatment choices, I would pick what was helping patients live the very longest. And of course, I wanted my doctor to provide me with a treatment protocol and suggestions on what to do for this cancer I knew nothing about. But I also wanted to base our decision on comparative data so we could make these important life and death decisions in an informed way. But unfortunately, nothing like that existed at the time, uh, but I was fortunate enough to have myeloma specialists on my care team. Being treated by two myeloma specialists really completely changed the course of my life, and I have been incredibly blessed to be in remission for eight years, which has allowed me to give back and do advocacy work for us all until there is a cure. Today, we will be talking to Dr. Rafael Fonseca, whose idea sparked the creation of HealthTree, which is a new online tool for myeloma patients that has a dual benefit. It helps us as patients better navigate our care and at the same time helps researchers identify new pathways to a cure. We'll be launching HealthTree in June and we'll be visiting over 50 cities this summer to host hands-on workshops across the United States to give you one-on-one -on -one help using this tool. To find the list of cities, you can go to the Myeloma Crowd website, which is melomacrowd.org, and click on the top of the Health Tree button. And uh, on that page will be a list of cities, and you can try to find a city near you. We'll be adding more cities over time, so keep watching that page for updates. And if you'd like to suggest a location where we should come, we will do our best to get a team member there. And with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Rafael Fonseca to the show. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny. My pleasure in being here. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for all you've done. Uh, let me first allow, I think, Dr. Fonseca, if you want to take it off speakerphone, I think it might be better because we're getting an echo a little bit. Okay. I'm off the speakerphone. Okay. So let me introduce you first before we get started. Um, Dr. Rafael Fonseca is a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and is chair of the Department of Internal Medicine also at the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. Dr. Fonseca was awarded the Getz Family Professor of Cancer Professorship Award and the Distinguished Mayo Clinic Investigator Award. He earned his medical degree at the Universidad Anahuac, Mexico, and completed his residency at the University of Miami in a fellowship in hematology and medical oncology at the Mayo Graduate School of Medicine in Rochester. He's a clinical investigator of the Damon Runyon Cancer Research Fund. Dr. Fonseca is the laboratory chair for the ECOG Myeloma Committee, which is a group that develops myeloma clinical trials. He's also a founding member of the MMRC, the research consortium of the MMRF. Dr. Fonseca reviews articles for medical publications and himself has authored an innumerable list of articles. In his lab, Dr. Fonseca leads a team with a focus on the cytogenetic nature of clonal cells of plasma cell diseases, including multiple myeloma, and is the current recipient of two prestigious multi-year SPORE grants. So, again, Dr. Fonseca, thank you so much for coming. No, again, um, thank you. The pleasure is mine. I'm delighted to be here with you. Well, I would like to also thank you for kind of the spark uh, of the idea for Health Tree. So maybe we want to start by just describing um, what prompted the idea for Health Tree, because you were, um, you were the, the spark that ignited thank this you. idea. Thank you. No, I'm happy happy to go through that, and um, also thank you to to those who are online. Um, if if I could just explain this briefly, we were uh, sitting around the table at uh, one of the ASH meetings and discussing some of the challenges that patients uh, face nowadays in 
the care for their myeloma. And I think uh, your story is quite uh, illustrative to that point, Jenny, that we find that there is a large fraction of patients that either at the time of diagnosis and some of them throughout their course uh, don't have access or don't uh, create connections with individuals who specialize in uh, multiple myeloma. Now, this, uh, I think it's uh, recognized as very important because the amount of knowledge that is constantly being generated about myeloma and the best uh, treatments for myeloma, um, ways and strategies in which patients should be managed is constantly changing. And uh, one of the focal points of our discussions was, well, what happens if you're in a rural region where maybe you have no options, you have no easy transportation, and you're going to be cared for by a general oncologist who, despite his or her best intentions, may not be up to speed with what's uh, uh, best a therapy or what's the best available for patients uh, with uh, multiple myeloma. And we talked about some of the ways in which people have tried to address this in the past. For instance, um, things like promoting continuous medical education, reaching out to those physicians and the like. But we came up with the idea of asking the following question, what if we empower the person who has the most at stake in that process, and that is the patient, to have at uh, their fingertips um, uh, information that, that now has evolved into this tool we call the health tree that would allow them to start uh, the conversation and, and prompt the right questions with their treating oncologist. So the, the goal that uh, initially started this in the SPARC was to provide a, um, a series of tools that would empower the patient to be more informed conversation. Now, that may seem difficult, but our assumption was at the time, and I think that holds true that we could actually put this together. We could put together a tool that would allow this conversation to start and patients to go back to their, to their treatment doctors and at least prompt the questions of what needs to be asked at the different stages of, of uh, diagnosis and treatment. And maybe before we go on to the questions, I'll just give a, a very specific example. If sure. a person, for instance, is thinking about, okay, you know, I have this this let's say newly diagnosed myeloma, to make it simple at this point, uh, what are my best treatment options? And if we can provide that through a tool like this, we realize this is not something that is dictating medical practice. We realize we're not trying to modify um, directly the, the behavior for the, those oncologists, but what we think is the patient should have some succinct and clear information that it would, would allow them to be a very significant part of that discussion. Oh, I, well, I completely agree because every time you go to see your doctor and something has happened with your myeloma, whether you're newly diagnosed or whether you're relapsing, and a lot of patients relapse multiple times, as we will know, then you need to make an, an, a very important treatment decision about your care. And I know I've heard you say other times that, you know, you were there to help guide the patient um, but in terms of picking, you know, a lot of that responsibility does still rest with the patient. That is correct. And I, I, that's, I, we know clearly that the patient, and with the support of their families, caregivers, and friends, are the ones who should be um, in, uh, driving the conversation about treatment choices. Now, we, we, we did ask the question at the time, well, isn't this too complicated? Can, you know, is, how is this going to be possible? And, and we, we started assuming, well, you know, at, at, at the end of the day, there's a, there's a, there's a finite, finite body of information. Of course, this will be changing over time, but there's a finite body of information from which we can approximate some, some of those recommendations. We may never have the perfect one, and the patient discussing with the physician should make that final decision, but we can guide them pretty close to what we think should be a good way of approaching a given situation with myeloma. Now, to do so, one has to know about the treatments, but one also has to know about the patient. You know, what is the age of the person? What other medical conditions do they have? How far away they, do they live from a, from a treatment center? Have they had any previous problems with, with, with similar drugs and so forth? And we can get into more of that detail 
but we felt those things could all come together in a tool like the health tree. Yes, absolutely. Um, a little bit about the importance of a specialist, because you touched on that at the very beginning. And before we start digging into some of the other features that HealthTree has, I'd just like to reiterate what you said at the beginning. There is research now that shows, both from the Mayo Clinic and from a recent uh, study at the University of North Carolina, that shows that myeloma patients who are seen by myeloma experts live longer. Well, that's that true, and I think I think you know there 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 is a significant factor there that we think that comes into play, and that is um, people who are seen by individuals who focus on a disease. And, and I'm going to venture out and say this is probably true for many other cancers. Are you know if you're a patient, you're being cared for by one of those physicians, you have a much greater chance of being, um, um, you know, to receive recommendations that are truly state-of-the-art. And, and that has been shown by, by a couple of, of clinical trials. Now, you know, uh, there is a possibility in some statisticians, so we say, well, you have to account to the patients get into the center, or they're a little bit healthier. But even when you look within a center, patients that are cared for by specialists, not oncologists alone, but oncologists that specialize in myeloma or hematologists, that specialize in myeloma, uh, the outcomes are, are, are better for patients. And it's just a reflection of, of, of the knowledge. Now, I, I know this can sound self-serving, but it is, I, I would say this is, this is not the case. This is more of a reflection of the amount of information and the burden mm-hmm. that one would have and just trying to keep up to date with everything that, that is happening. And as I always tell my patients, I literally don't know whether the recommendations I'm giving you today might already have changed by the time we would discuss them again six months or a year from now. Well, I totally agree. And um, Dr. Langren mentioned that too. He said, you know, in myeloma, it used to be that you could do an update in myeloma at a meeting every two years or so, and it would be totally sufficient. And he just said, no, six months is almost not enough. Uh, The advances are happening so rapidly now in myeloma, which is a huge blessing and also a challenge that we decided to move forward on because we agree with you. Um, so one thing that we've built into HealthTree is the ability for patients to better understand their treatment options. So like you were saying, there were some questions that you can ask, and I know sometimes it might be fitness status, for example. So patients who are very unfit or frail probably are not going to be getting stem cell transplants. Or if a patient has a prior health condition like a severe cardiac issue or very extreme neuropathy, there are some treatment options that probably would not be considered for that patient. Is that accurate? And that that is correct. And the reality is when when, uh, any one of us who specializes in myeloma walks into an office and we meet with a patient and their families, we bring all of these factors into play and they're part of our consideration as we decide on what may be the best next treatment. And uh, some of those things are, are um, obvious, if you may. But, you know, for instance, if there was a, a patient who already had, for even for other reasons, let's say a patient had a peripheral neuropathy. Let me give you an example. Patients with diabetes can have uh, peripheral neuropathy because of their diabetes, especially if it's a diabetes that has been diagnosed many years later. Well, any myeloma specialist that walks into that room should immediately have a little red flag that tells uh, that oncologist, well, you know, it's true that you could use medications such as the bortezomib, the Velcade, but perhaps you should consider other things that would have a lower risk of making that neuropathy worse. And that's what we're trying to capture with a tool like the Health Tree that, that brings to the forefront a way that uh, you could, one, think about maybe avoiding some medications or at the very least to create a different priority in how would you use those medications so that uh, one, one has it right there in front, of the, in front of the oncologist, the consideration of that particular toxicity. And that goes to every other uh, realm that we consider important. So we talk about neuropathy, you know, we need to talk about the the health of the heart, and the, but the performance status is a, it's a very good one, as, as you state, uh, 
Jenny, that um, you know, if if someone is is not well enough and it's not strong enough, it's really not a good idea to try to push that person and try to say we 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 should get to the to the stem cell transplant right away. Now, they may get stronger. That may be a possibility down the line. Um, and and the good news is we have so many new medications that are approved that there's usually much more than just one path to approach uh, the treatment of the disease. Right. So what we've done in HealthTree is to take all those types of factors and take them into account and then look at all the different options that are available. And when you talk about myeloma therapies, there are so many different treatments and now so many combinations of treatments that can be put together. Um, It's really, truly incredible. So how does a patient navigate when you're talking about general education versus personalized education? So the goal is to help patients identify different treatment options that might be right for them personally and understand also the clinical trials that might be right for them personally. And for each of those different options, we have created a page with a description and a rationale about that option and a way to um, that with links to research papers and videos by experts talking about that. So a patient could review that before they go to their appointment. They could take personal notes on it. They could print it out. And then what you said earlier is correct. It is a um, conversation starter with their doctor to say, let's talk about these three different options. And then you've read up on the options before you even walk into the clinic. So you can use your time just really wisely because we know how busy you are. Well, if I could build up on that very, very last point, which is so important, um, uh, under the best of circumstances, everyone is limited on on time. And and one of the things I always tell my patients is anything we can do together to optimize the time we're face-to-face, it's going to be to your benefit. So let me give you an example. You know, in the in the um, uh, older days, and and you know, uh, before we, we you know we have had availability of tools like Health Tree. I would always tell patients, you know, it really serves us well if if you actually personally keep track of this in some form of a table. You know, the easiest way to do that, for instance, with a computer with Excel, but even a paper table would be good enough. And the reason is that if you give me that information, and particularly if we're bringing together you know, lab results from different hospitals and different clinics, it makes it so much simpler that I can immediately focus on what the trend is and what the problem might be if there's one. So we can spend most of our time in a meaningful engagement. The the complete opposite of this would be that, you know, I walk into a room and, and someone would say, well, yes, they told me they were sending the labs and I go out and I don't find the labs. And it turns out that we have to call another physician's office, and then we wait for a fax to come to come in. And when I get a fax, I just have some numbers that sometimes are barely legible in that fax. So we spend all of that time just trying to gather the information, when in fact we could have been spending that in a more meaningful um, face-to-face um, uh, conversation. So, and our, our thought is that the, the the output that people get with something like Health Tree would would allow them not only to do that, but also even if, if you're going for the first time to, an, to a new doctor, a new provider, you can immediately show that, and they should be able to say, oh, this is very clear. I know what the person has received, what the outcomes are, and maybe what my consideration should be next. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And in showing HealthTree to multiple myeloma specialists, they're very uh, excited and captivated by our summary page <laughs> because – you, it has a list of, you know, situations about your, yourself as a patient, your diagnosis date, your type of diagnosis, um, the different genetics, myeloma genetics you might have, some of your latest lab results, and um, in, just information that would help them understand your fitness status. And in one, in one page, you can see really a quick summary history of what the patients received, how they responded, some of their side effects, and it's just extremely valuable to have just a quick summary that you could even save as a PDF and email to another doctor when you're going into a consult. That is that is correct. And and um and again, this is just is a win-win situation. That's the key thing. It really 
um, um, you know, it's 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 it just allows for that conversation to happen. I, I'll just say with a little bit of a comic relief that, you know, some of my favorite patients, some of my more difficult patients are engineers. And the reason for that is engineers can come with the most beautiful documents, not only that show me the data, but very elegantly graph what's going on. And so, so as far as information, it's, it's, it's fantastic to work with engineers. I see, I see it's, uh, I, I say yes, sometimes it's harder just because sort of biology works different from what you normally, you know, would, would see in engineering that's a little bit more predictable. But that aside, it's really um, uh, great to, to be in a, in a console room where we actually have all of this information handy. And, and again, the key point is it just immediately takes you to the meaningful conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we talk about treatment options and how they're presented back to the patients. And there are quite a few different treatment options. So what we've tried to do in HealthTree is not only present all the treatment options, but not to overwhelm the patient, to try to offer some expert preferred or suggested kind of guidance. And the ultimate personalized medicine is going to your doctor's office and having that conversation with your doctor. But um, it can give you a little guidance and help navigate that down a little bit. And I know we've had some people ask, how, how are those treatment options being identified? And that will be through results from a survey that we're doing with myeloma experts to see how they commonly treat specific situations. Yes, and, and, and this will be, I, I think it's important to say, this will be constantly evolving. I know right. one, of the, one of the hopes is that uh, this, this survey will be part of a, a living and breathing document where, where as, as, as people um, understand better data that is shared, for instance, from clinical trials or updates that we have from these trials, we can, we can provide more current recommendations uh, with, with regards to specific treatments. Um, I, I think to some degree this would be consensus recommendations, and, and, and to some degree there's going to be some things there that are going to be just a natural consequence of, of what uh, you know, most people would do. So, for instance, I mentioned the, the neuropathy. So it's a very easy example. If you have someone who has peripheral neuropathy, on that person we should try to avoid, um, if at all possible, not that it's contraindicated, but if at all possible, you should try to avoid further administration of something like Velcade. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And as more patients join the system, then we can start actually seeing patterns of optimal care by patient type, which was kind of my dream uh, when I was first diagnosed. Show me all the patients that look like me, maybe with my genetics, maybe in my same age group. Show me what they got for treatment, and then show me what's working the best or what's giving them the longest progression-free survival or overall survival. I think that type of data um, is a natural outcome of health tree. You know, there's there's a growing body of literature, and, and uh, we have talked about this, uh, Jenny, regarding what people call real-world data, and, and there's there's a lot of power in that research. And this would probably fall somewhere in between that real-world data and the standard clinical trial. For those mm-hmm. of, of, of uh, Austin and Nicole who might not be as familiar with real-world data, there's, there's what you know, people call in other fields big data. So sometimes things like very large databases from insurance companies that can, can really provide a very, very interesting information. Oftentimes uh, their power is in the numbers that they, they can he- have very, very uh, large uh, numbers of, of patients with a given condition. Uh, the one thing that becomes a bit more challenging is that they they don't necessarily have the detail that, for instance, a medical record or a registry like like this one could potentially um, uh, have. So 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 I think this could also serve as a platform, and where you know patients share information, share experiences, uh, and and either uh, I'm going to go as far as, far as saying either patient driven or even physician driven, uh, some specific research questions could be addressed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So what we were, were offering in HealthTree, because we wanted to extend the power of a system like this, um, not only can you find treatment options, um, you can find clinical trials. I think we'll come back to that later. But you can also help advance a cure for through advanced, by speeding up research. So if an investigator has a question, and typically they would have to construct a very large study, and it would be expensive and costly and um, take a lot of time. You could 
just easily ask a research question of the myeloma patients in the system, like, have you been revaccinated after a stem cell transplant? And then quickly you could assess, oh, well, 80% of patients have been revaccinated and or they or you know twenty only twenty percent of patients are really getting the pneumococcal vaccine um, after transplant or on an annual basis. I mean, all sorts of questions. Have you had min, min, like minimal residual disease testing performed in the last year? And do you even know what that means? Just really key questions could be answered very very quickly. And whoever responds to the questions, uh, the survey can, responses can go back to the investigator asking the questions, as well as the patients who participated in the questions. So at all times, the patients can continue learning about myeloma and about their best optimal care options. And, and you know, one one of the things that I that I would say, and 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 obviously this is this is an important part of the goal. But even um, you know, for for the person who might be listening, if you know, if you would ask the question, well, what's in it for me? I think even if 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 the the, the research, which always takes some time, would take some time to yield, just the practical implications of having a tool like this that can help you enter that information and generate this very succinct report that then your uh, physician could look at and and have a very clear idea of what's going on. It's of great help just on the day-to-day clinical practice. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So we are capturing some lab value data also because that is critical to ensure that you um, are able to join clinical trials. A lot of clinical trials will have inclusion criteria or um, reasons that, or you know, lab values that will direct whether you can join a, a study or not. And so, because we are integrating with Spark Cures for clinical trials, I know a lot of you are very familiar with Spark Cures which we think is just one of the best tools out there to find my lo- multiple myeloma clinical trials specifically. So you'll be able to find treatment options as well as clinical trials. And for that, we'll ask for some lab value data. But over time, uh, we'll, we'll also be inviting you to um, add more lab value data. And we've had some patients who have now tested the software out from early um, groups that we've tested it in. And they've said, you know, I have one facility where I have an actual medical online medical record, and the second facility has nothing. They don't provide anything electronically, so I have to ask for a lab printout every single time I go. So now I have two different sets of lab values. You know, I might go to my specialist and get some lab values done there, and then I go back to my local community center, and most of my labs are are there. So he said, I really want to be able to track my lab values. So we've included a way to do that as well. Oh that 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 is so important. And you know, let me let me give you another another uh, uh practical application for this, just speaking about lab values. You know, as as you state you go to different different places. Uh very simply and I, I, I hope many of you have not faced this, but you should know that if you measure the serum free light chain, not every lab value uses the same units. So it it has happened uh, on on a number of occasions that people compare different lab values with different values, and and that immediately creates concern if it goes up, whether it's progression, if it goes down, you know why is it going down so much? Maybe this is good, and and we need to have some of that consistency. So having just a centralized tool when you can start doing some of those comparisons becomes very important. I think it would make those things quite a bit more self uh, self evident. The other one is that when I see a new patient, just let me sort of walk you through the classic scenario. Let's say I see a new patient that we get a call from a physician in the community. Would you mind seeing this person? Because, you know, we're, we're, we're a little bit stuck. We don't know where to go next. It is not unusual for us to get 200 to 300 pages that are printed out, which could be a combination of very legible medical records and very illegible uh, blood work and uh, nursing orders and flow charts from from uh, chemotherapy, etc. And the modern physician is supposed to go and extract all the information for those 300 pages, uh, literally in the same amount of time it takes to do that consult and have all of that interaction with the patient. And that's what we do. Some some physicians uh, take time in advance and they prepare for this. Some of them do this just right before the consultation. Some of them will do it right in the room with the patient as they're looking at these records. And, and and that's, of course, the, the part of current practice. But one could very easily argue that's not optimal uh, use of the time of anyone. 
And if we could already get a head start, just with that simple sheet that would tell you, okay, this was the date of diagnosis, this was the first treatment that was done from this day to that date, this were some of the things that were thought about the treatment at the time, even as that physician still goes through that stack of papers, which they still will do, that's part of what we do, it's a lot easier to understand what you're looking at because you already have a summary of what the, the history is there. You know what the story is there. So, so, so that would be, again, of, of uh, a win-win situation for physicians and for patients. Well, I agree. And then you add the lab value data so you could track the free light chains or you could track the M spike from the beginning of the treatment and then watch it, you know, through all different treatments and have even a list of most the five mo- the five last lab values. Um so you have that on your summary page. That would just be additive. And and you know, I think one of the things that the the audience should know which you have built into this uh you have some tools that you can actually show trends. And and the only the only thing that's important about uh, data, as we all know, is trends. It's not only the absolute numbers, but what's happening to them over time. And and if you have the availability of that through the health tree, then it's it's easier to visualize what what's going on. Mhm. And it's in one place. Exactly. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how this could help advance research. You mentioned a little bit before. And I know there are IRB studies, and um, maybe you can explain the IRB study process. But we intentionally didn't create this to be an IRB study because we wanted it to be this living, breathing, continuously improving platform. So maybe you could kind of state the difference between what you see typical clinical trial studies and the health tree. Well, there's there's a there's a whole range of things that can be approved through IRB type uh, protocols. The most common ones that we do are are treatment protocols, and and there's uh, usually people think about three phases: the phase ones where uh, a group of patients uh, is treated as you're trying to understand a new medication, particularly with regards to toxicity. Uh, once that is completed, phase two means that a group of patients with a given condition is treated with the hopes of understanding whether there is significant activity of such medication. And phase three is when that is compared to the standard of care. Sometimes that may be that alone versus the standard of care. Sometimes that could be adding that extra new thing to the standard of care. Uh, the, you know, an easy example probably for the audience, when people looked at the Aspire clinical trial, that looked at the combination of carfilzomib, lenalidomide, which is Revlimid, and dexamethasone, versus Revlimid dexamethasone, that's a phase three trial because half of the arm gets the Revlimid, the other half doesn't get it. Now, what these trials have in common is they all require a pre-specified type of uh, individual, type of patient that would be eligible to go into such trials. And then, you know, they're they're seen in the clinic and we, we offer uh, participation to patients in these trials and then they're, they're monitored, but they, they reflect a, a very defined and unique subset of of individuals with a condition. Now, on their IRB, you can do other things that uh, could be, for instance, registries or retrospective uh, review of data. But I think the way you envision this, this is this is more a living and breathing document. It's a it's a it's a registry that's maintained, augmented, and and really uh, curated uh, for patients and by patients. And and that's really the the, the beauty of this is that. It's sort of a, like what we're seeing in many other realms in our life. This is just an, uh, a way in which voluntarily you have an um, um, electronic or an online community that is all contributing to a body of knowledge, and that's the vision for for the health tree. That there's this mutual understanding that you know if you participate in this, there's some some positive that 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 comes out of this, of course, from from the availability of this tool and. Probably that that is the number one uh, driving factor. But then, you know, as, as patients get together, you could, you could very easily envision that if you start getting this to grow, then you can ask some very specific questions. I think you 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 said, well, you know, how many people get the the, the vaccinations as they're, as they're supposed to get it? Well, maybe that can be asked to this tool. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, as many in the audience know that we use uh, medications to protect the bones in patients with myeloma. Uh, But as it turns out, that's not always 
done. And there's sometimes good reasons why that is not done, but sometimes um, it's just that it's, it's just one of the very last things that people are thinking when they think about the treatment of myeloma. They may forget about the use of, of, of bone protecting agents. And I think tools like this will build on, on those aspects um, in medicine. A lot of this is, is considered under that tent of quality or the quality practice. And I think something like this can be tremendously helpful there. Mm-hmm. Well, our goal is to support researchers, and that's why we have a dual uh, benefit, is immediately help patients by helping them understand what options they have available, but also help, it's an, also an education tool with support for researchers. So a researcher could say, how long has had, you know, Revlimid or Velcade been used over the long term, or what was the average time to treatment from an MGUS or smoldering myeloma diagnosis? And what about for people with high-risk features? Um, Tell me about their outcomes as well. So our goal is to offer a free portal login to verified myeloma researchers so that when they help make HealthTree better with the logic and other features that that they can um, add their expertise to, then they also benefit from the data in in HealthTree. And HealthTree becomes this very easily accessible tool, of course, for de-identified or anonymous data. And patients own their own data in HealthTree. So that's a very key point, that patients are in charge of their data and they own their data and they are willing to, to share it without names or emails and, and things like that. Um, that that piece won't be shared. But the other information, I mean, you could do so many searches inside of HealthTree about even things like, do you have any known autoimmune disorders? Or what's your quality of life right now? Um, Doctors want to know this type of information, and they're just so busy and overwhelmed with their own practices and their own research And this type of research is not easily performed. It's expensive and it takes time. Well, there's no doubt. The the process of clinical research is very, very um, slow and it's very expensive. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's it's something that can easily go into the scores of millions of dollars very, very quickly, even for a small trial. So, so hopefully, one of one of the one of the, the the potential for this is to help ask and answer some of those questions that traditionally would not be um, amenable for clinical trials. Mm -hmm. I know that when you look at a myeloma patient, you're looking at them from, like what you said earlier, you're, you're looking at their fitness status by having them walk into your clinic room. But they come with a whole history also. Like how do they respond to their drugs? What are their myeloma genetics? What are those features? Have they had genetic testing performed? That's a really interesting question. Um, What type of quality of life have they had? What type of side effects have they experienced? What type of family history do they have? So I know Dr. Gobriel is working on a study right now to to, um, assess, you know, are these early precursor conditions and family members. So is that something that we could also capture inside of HealthTree, and and we are, and that is something that's easily captured because a lot of this information is not in the EHR record. I read a study that showed that only 8% of of a normal person's, maybe myeloma is more, person's uh, healthcare information is actually in their EHR record at the clinic, and it's all over the place. You know, it's at the allergy office, and it's at the chiropractor's office, and it's here and it's there, and most of it is sitting inside the heads of myeloma patients. So how do we all share that so we can come to faster conclusions for you? Well, I, I think that's that's a great point because if you if you look at the typical um, uh, note from a clinician encounter, and again, keep in mind, um, and, and, and this is just to describe what happens in the real world, so the, the, the average physician may see three, four new patients sometimes in a day. They have to see 15 or 20 returns. That is, they get to work sometimes at 7 in the morning. They have to run, do this. They have to go for lunch. They do this afternoon sometimes to go back to the hospital and then try to make it home in time for dinner. And by the time it all is said and done, they're supposed to have captured all of this information in, in, in a very accurate and, 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 uh, and um, you know, as, uh, objective manner as possible. Now, 
in this process, getting all the details, for instance, of a family history, as you just described, Jenny, is really not one of the top priorities. So if you actually go and look at the clinical notes and they talk about family history, there'll be a, f a few remarks there, but rarely would you see a more nuanced level of detail that would allow you to ask questions such as you are proposing. And I think something like this, that it's uh, patient-entered, uh, you could spend more time thinking, well, yes, my grandfather maybe had this or, you know, my mother had this particular condition. And I think uh, we will have some depth that has not traditionally been captured in the standard medical record. Mm -hmm. Well, in my mind, I think you're being asked to do an impossible task. <laughs> it, it is it's hard. I have just been putting a plug in for that. <laughs> well, it's amazing that you're able to do what you do because you're seeing patients and you're trying to assess all this information about the patient, make it personally relevant to them. And so this becomes a tool to help you do your job so that you can use your time as effectively and wisely as possible. You know, can I, can I, I can maybe interject just the one brief story. Once I was talking to, to a person in a, in a patient support group, and, and someone made the comment, well, you know, I, I, I just don't get it. You know, we send the faxes, and I don't have the kind of the complete set of messages back with all the information of what am I supposed to be doing, someone who's not being seen in that particular practice. And I just had to go on to say, well, you know, it's not really until you sit down in front of that person that that you engage, and it does take time. It does take mental energy. You have to sit. You have to ask, how are you doing? Are these labs okay? Where, was something happening when you had this blood work? That you can engage into that process. So this this notion of, uh, uh, for the lack of better words, like a fax came into the office. So I'm assuming everything is fine because I assume they have looked at it, and they probably went back and they looked at my record and made sure the numbers were fine or not. That is more often than not not the case because it's not until you sit with, with the patient and the person that you have that time to do that analysis. So unless someone is explicitly telling you that they're going to work with you and there's no easy way to do that with the current medical environment, uh, there's, there, there's a lot that really has to be co-responsibility from patients. Mm -hmm. Now, when we think about personal, we've probably heard a lot about personalized medicine recently, and I know a lot of the focus has been on genomics, and then I know a lot of the, uh, about the specific, you know, different clones in the myeloma tumor, which is really, really important. Uh, I know I've heard a lot of other doctors say sometimes it's the, the strength of the immune system additive to that because that's what's happening in the bone marrow microenvironment. But then you layer on top of that, like, particular side effects that a patient might have had or um, their quality of life type of issues or just the impact of their depth of remission. And so it seems like personalized medicine to me is genomics, yes, um, but the whole picture of the patient. Yes, of course, of course. And, you know, one could argue a little bit of this is semantics. And, and uh, for for those of you who are in social media, you sometimes see, see doctors spending an inordinate amount of time fighting over what means what. Uh, but the the term personalized medicine has been used mostly to refer to genetics. But in reality, everything we do in medicine is personalized because it's not a cliche, but every single patient is different. Everyone is an N of one. Uh, one of the common questions we get is, well, what do you think about patients that are like me with this situation? Well, I can tell you about a certain aspect of their care, but what I can tell to every patient is everyone is different. So, 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 so that's why this this tool brings into in, uh, brings to the forefront of that conversation, not only the genetic factors, but uh, factors that relate to the person health, and 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 again, I think we made allusion to as well. It, it doesn't matter how easy it is for you to get to a treatment center, if uh, if you don't have um, um, a capacity to be driving or you live far away from a treatment center. That would be an important factor if, if one has two treatments that are equivalent and one includes medications that can be given as a pill orally. Well, we understand that sometimes has other implications. Maybe there's differences in how one has to deal with copay and copay assistance, but maybe that has a benefit that you don't have to be driving to the treatment center as frequently. So all of that comes into place on how and to play in how one does this more tailored or more personalized approach for selection of treatment for a person. Mm hmm Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the way I look at it is, you know, we started Myeloma Crowd Radio to ask the question, how can patients themselves help advance a cure? What's 
something that we can do because we're not going to step into your lab. Um, we're not going to do the experiments. We're not going to run the clinical trials, but we could participate in the clinical trials. Um, and when you look at, you referred to big data, when you look at big data projects that are overarching, so Microsoft Health Vault tried a big data project and Google Health tried a big data project. And I think there are three challenges to data projects. Uh, the first is that they sometimes people want patients to share their data, but they don't give anything back that's valuable to the patient. So when we designed HealthTree, we made sure that it provided value back to patients. And the second challenge I think that it's common is sometimes they go too big and broad and say, you know, just it's not disease specific. So this is disease specific. We only care about myeloma and I'll be so happy the day myeloma is cured because I will go swimming with my children <laughs> or do something else and go get ice cream and, you know, relax and not, um, not work so hard, I think. Um, and then the third challenge is that data is everywhere. You know, it's in myeloma patients' heads and, and in their lab records and in their genomic data, and it's hard pulling it all together. So that's what we've worked to provide with HealthTree. You know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say something that's gonna be maybe a little bit from the from the left field here, but I think as you look at data, data can sometimes be comforting. And uh, I'm I'm just gonna make an allusion when 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 I was uh, you know in training, um, you sometimes uh, you know you, as, as a physician you go through a process that, and probably this will resonate with a, with a lot of people too that you know you're barely making ends meet in your life with money. And sometimes one is even fearful of going to the bank account to see what the numbers are. <laughs> and it, it's not infrequent that once you see it, maybe you don't like it, but at least you don't have the anxiety of the unknown. And I think sometimes having this information, I, I've seen this over and over with patients, if we have this information, even if sometimes we don't get the results we need, you remove the question of what, what are they you at least know what they are. So that can be a significant component of anxiety. Now, everyone has different ways on how they approach things. But, but for a good number of people, just understanding where you are at least gives you the peace of mind of not knowing necessarily that everything is well, but knowing where you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And going back to what you said earlier in the show, for the majority of myeloma patients, these 80% of myeloma patients, which is most of us who are being seen in community centers, how do they leverage the power? How do they connect with a specialist like you? Um, how how do they access that deep level of expertise? And they still, you know, would benefit from a myeloma specialist on their team. There's no question about that. And we'll have links to myeloma specialists so they can find you. But um, helping elevate the standard of treatment in multiple myeloma is one of our big pushes and one of the reasons that we're doing this we want to reach everybody that has myeloma we want everyone to have good outcomes not just those who live close to academic centers well that that obviously is, is really our goal and our wish with this project we wish everyone could be seen at an academic center we realize at least currently that's practically impossible but is there a way that that information could be could be sent out? And um, uh, maybe this was not as self-evident as we started the program, but now that you've heard a little bit more about the, 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 the health tree, our goal is that the message goes straight to the patient, it's not to the physician, straight to the patients to empower for that conversation. And we also mentioned that this is, this is not medical practice. I think this is very important. Right. We're not prescribing, we're not making the treatment recommendations. But you could imagine if there's someone who has received a number of treatments, and again, let's say the person already has a neuropathy or developed a neuropathy with the Velcid regimen, and if the person shows up to that oncologist, which uh, parenthetically, oncologists who are in the community tend, tend to be even busier than academic oncologists. They can see sometimes 30 or even 40 patients in a day. The time wow. they have for that interaction can be quite minimal. So, 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 and oftentimes, you know, patients are working also with some of their delegates, their, their physician assistants and nurse practitioners. So just a mere factor that a patient could say, as an example, say I'm in the health tree and it tells me that maybe because I am getting Velcade, I just need a reminder, uh, you know, can we talk about my neuropathy or I'm getting Velcade? Can I get a reminder about the use for a, a cyclovir? I should be getting a cyclovir. 
Or if the person, the proteins are rising, the patient could come up and say, you know, based on what I'm finding here from Health Tree, I'd like to talk to you about maybe the combination of daratumumab with um, pomalotomide and dexamethasone, as a, just as an example, right? So it mm-hmm. would prompt a more educated conversation. And if I may say so, it may even increase the education and the awareness of the physicians, which I'm not saying anything negative about them. It's just that it is a real challenge for a general oncologist to stay up to speed on everything there is to be known about myeloma. Right, when you're treating 12 or 15 other cancers. So it's, that's We talked about you're having an impossible task, and it's just like 10x. Exactly. So. And, and, you know, when, when one deals with diseases where there's not a lot of change, well, you can master it, but one of the one of the the, the beautiful things about being a participant in this myeloma field is that everything moves so fast that we mm-hmm. just you just can't master it, and there's so much to be to to be known. I and 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 I think you know when when you you think an oncologist is going to be up to speed in lung cancer, breast cancer, lymphoma, colon cancer, and then by the way, they're also going to be experts in myeloma. It's just just realistically impossible. Mhm. Absolutely. Well, before I I want to leave enough time for a caller question. So, if you have a caller, if you have a question for Dr. Fonseca, you can dial 347-637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad. And um we have a few questions. So, 9836757, go ahead with your question. If you have a caller, if you have a question for Dr. Fonseca, you oh, can I dial 347-637 Hello? Go Hello. Yep, go ahead with your question. Oh, hi, I'm so sorry. This is Dana Holmes. Hi, Dr. Fonseca. Hi, Jenny. Thanks Dana, so hi. much. Dana. Hi, thanks so much for this wonderful program. I was just thrilled to listen in on it. And I really just wanted to thank you both for being champions for the myeloma community. It's um it, it's just so important to know that the you know, our top specialists really do care and, and are stepping up and trying to find ways to help all sorts of patients, patients that have access to the specialists and patients that don't. Um, you know, I've been the queen of overview uh, charts and of my lab work and, and imaging diagnostic, diagnostic history really from the very day that I was um, diagnosed. And it just makes for such a better and productive consult whenever I do go to any specialist, whether it be a new one and whether it be my, my current one. Um, I just remember when I was first diagnosed with smoldering myeloma, I felt really stunned. And I just really had no direction, didn't know where to start. And it's just I've worked really hard at actually becoming a very informed and empowered patient. So I just really see this as just another tool to really help me continue. So with all that said, I have a question. Will will Health Tree capture um, – specifically smoldering and myeloma trial participation and outcomes that patients obviously um, uh, self-report, which I as a smoldering patient or another myeloma patient could actually review because I see this as a really super helpful tool to see more real-time experience outcomes rather than waiting for abstracts and published articles, which really the average patient doesn't have access to. Yes, I, and I can speak to the components, certainly, of the data that is captured. And I should start by saying, Dana, you obviously are the champion of champions as well, too. So <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. Yes, I agree. I'm honored, to, I'm honored to have you say that. Thank you. <laughs> but but the answer is yes. Uh, the, the health tree will, will have fields for, for, for uh, capturing the information regarding its moldering. And I think it will evolve as far as how it's linked to uh, clinical trials and clinical trial data. Uh, but another way, I think you make a great point. How do you how do you see this real time? You know, one one of the ways in which the real time world has shown us something is this application of ways. I don't know how many of you use that to navigate, but it tells you real time. You know what the traffic is, and I can envision how as this grows and there's more and more participants in this, you can imagine a future where there's a new drug that has a certain side effect that maybe something like the health tree could detect before we even have reports about it in the medical literature. Yeah, that's that's really um fascinating and I look forward to to becoming part of this and and you know I'm I'm not in treatment, I'm smoldering. Um but I will enroll in just about any 
uh, study, observational study that I can, whether it means um, you know, just giving my data or I'm, I'm enrolled in, in Dr. Gobriel's P-Crowd study. I've been in that for the last three years, um, providing her with you know, my, my bone marrow samples, my, my blood samples. It's the simplest thing to do. And I, I just, um, I'm thrilled that this is going to go bigger and better because I really think patients, if they learn about this, they'll be more willing to, and, and especially with Jenny, what you said about getting something out of it. Because that's really critical. You know, you, patients are sitting at their computers and spending a whole bunch of time inputting all this data, and then they never see anything. Right. So, yeah, right. no. so the that fact that we'll happen. be getting, <laughs> yeah, the fact that we'll be getting something tangible out of it is just really, um, really, really great. And I'm wondering, now, I know that you're going to be doing all sorts of um, uh, stopovers during the summer and going to all sorts of cities and, and doing these sit-down meetings with people. But for the, for the patients that can't attend them, are you guys going to be doing any online tutorials or, or video tutorials that we could actually sit and, and watch and, and educate ourselves on how to use this? Yes. Yeah, so we have taken the product now to three or four different user groups, and we had very kind myeloma patients walk through the system and give us their feedback. And we really took that feedback and almost completely rearranged whole sections of Health Tree thanks to mm-hmm. their feedback. So we're in great gratitude that, you know, we owe them a debt of gratitude for that because they help make it better. So our goal is to make it simple enough with video tutorials on the pages. So inside of the system, ah, you can click on a mm-hmm. video tutorial and see, well, this is how I add my prior treatment and my side effects and my outcomes. So um, our goal is to make it as simple as possible so that patients can use it online from home if they need to. But we understand that a lot of people sometimes don't feel very comfortable with technology. Mm-hmm. So whether whether you're having a spouse help you or a child help you or even a grandchild in some situations help you, um, we want to provide a lot of different ways to help patients. And for those who want hands-on help, We'll have teams of people sitting there just helping you go through. And what we Great. found by the time we had kind of changed the system and made it simpler and easier to use, most patients were just kind of going through it on their own without needing much help on our end. Great. Jenny, will there be any sort of 800 call-in number for basic and general questions if somebody's sitting there and getting stuck and, you know, something that they're, they, you know, the video is not working and they can't kind of get all the way through or a way to email you guys and say, hey, this is the, this is the problem that I'm encountering. How can, pe- how can patients actually communicate to the folks behind Health Tree? Yeah, right now we have a feedback button in the system mm-hmm. because we still want your feedback. So if you have issues, you can click on the feedback button and describe your problem. We'll also be adding an online live chat so you could chat with somebody while you're in oh, the system. Oh, great. Nice and they could help you. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, again, thank you both. And um, I wish you both a wonderful weekend, and I look forward to this. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dana. Thanks. And it was so delightful to meet Dana. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> it was, Jenny. Yes, it, it was. was so it was a <laughs> terrific meeting, too. Terrific meeting. Okay, our next caller is 9924568. Go ahead with your question. Well, hello Jenny. This is uh Gary Peterson, Dr. Fox. Oh, how are you doing? Hi Gary, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. I I just wanted to uh um kind of add that uh, or not add or ask the question. This is not specifically like a male input, right? There's other inputs from other um myeloma specialist, for example, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Langren from Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dr. Uh, Gobriel from Dana-Farber, Dr. Orlowski from et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, a lot of different um, inputs into this, including a lot of patient advocates. Is that correct? Oh, correct. Or, um, That's absolutely correct, and we should have been more emphatic about that because that it is, it, is, it will be a, um, a joint effort. We, I, th- I think, um, there was sort of an, an, a nuclear product that was started, uh, but I think the idea is that 
the knowledge that will support the recommendations that are made will be, again, a knowledge that will come from, from all sorts of places and with uh, myeloma specialists from across the country. And I'm going to say again, I'm going to use the waste analogy. As, as, as we know what are the best paths to move forward, I think that's what's going to shape the content of what's in the app. And another point, and just it's, in my opinion, what you guys are doing, Jenny, and, and you and, and the whole group is – one of the most significant things that's come out of uh, out of uh, myeloma uh, treatment in a long, long time. And I'll say this for, you know, I have a website, myelomasurvival.com. People ask me for their inputs um, and what they should do. And one of the things I frequently say is go to the MSMART program, which is all Mayo. And, um, you know, if you can, have your oncologist, you know, follow those recommendations. And this just takes that program, adds the uh, input from Dana-Farber, you know, MD Anderson, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, Mass General, and a number of other great locations, and just takes it to the whole next level. So, you know, to me... Um, this is not only something that's good for the, the patients here in the United States, but this could be just such a boon to the underserved population in the world. Well, thank you very much, Gary, and we'll, we'll build on that. And I think, uh, as, as you mentioned, you know, we'll, we'll do this as a, as a global build-up. All right. Sounds great. Great talking to you. Thank you, Gary. Oh, great talking to you. Oh. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Gary. Okay, one more caller at 949-5572. Go ahead with your question. Oh, thank you for picking me. <laughs> I was. <laughs> this is Paul Alstrom. Hi, hi, Dr. Fonseca. Hi. Hello. Good afternoon, Paul. ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was sending Jenny text messages. Please pick me. <laughs> and I and I thought for sure because we're running out of time. She's going to pass over me. I send a little prayer, little prayer hands. <laughs> um, first of all, Jenny, congratulations on I think it's your 110th show. And um, I think so. Um, and uh, Dr. Fonseca, thank you for. I just I remember that moment like it was yesterday when you suggested this idea, and it was something that had been percolating it around. And you brought clarity to it in a couple of sentences that provide the leadership for this. So um, thank you so much. Oh, no, I'm honored. And thank you for the, for the, for the trust. I, I, I'm just thinking I probably just crystallized what obviously had become a great, great need. And, and we, we see this as, 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 a, as a way forward for the future. And I think if, if we could put a particular value out for this is, that patient that has a hard time traveling or that patient that has a hard time getting to one of this uh, more uh, specialized reference center should derive benefit from the information of the health tree. And that would be um, uh, hopefully something we, we, we can objectively show as we move forward. It's going to be exciting to see the, the, the patients um, participating actively at, a, at, a, at the next level in their care and um, how exciting this is to see the advancement that could come and the acceleration of what's happening. Um, yes, and we, we want one, to have many more components to it, of course, as we move forward. Many years ago, a doctor told Jenny, we think we can cure 5 to 10% of the patients, but we're not sure which 5 to 10% and how or why. And so what's happening is people are getting treated and all these hundreds of permutations and that knowledge is completely lost and it's not available back to a researcher that can take that hypothesis, go back in and do a study on it and take it to the next level. And so this provides so many more data points for researchers. I think it's going to speed the pulse of information, the pace of learning so much faster. And, um, and I'm, I, I'm just over the moon excited about this. Well, thank you again. Appreciate the support and the trust. Well, All right. Thank well, you so thanks much. a lot. And, uh, and, uh, hey, hey, Jen, you want to have dinner tonight? <laughs> it is Friday night. <laughs> it is Friday <Sure>. night. 
<laughs> Tell me when the show's over. All right. Well, uh, and Jenny, if right. I may say, I think uh, the, you know, with Paul's comments, you really should be the focal point for the credits for uh, you know pushing all of this forward and. And uh, it's been just a heroic amount of work that has gotten you to this point. So thank you for that, too, as well. Well, we know that um, I, I'm sure we'll have things we want to improve and change over time. But we believe that we can provide great value to patients um, right from the get-go. So, Dr. Fonseca, again, we're so thankful for your participation and, um, you know, your initiative in this project. And we're thankful for patients who are willing to share their experience so that everyone can benefit. And truly, in my mind, it's a way that patients can be part of the cure. So with that, thank I you. just thank you. Okay. So thank you so much for listening to Myeloma Crowd Radio. And we invite you to tune in next time to learn more about the latest in myeloma research and what it means for you. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to Chumbacasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.